Though the Israeli-Palestinian conflict didn't start with the June 1967 war, the conflict would draw the borders which shaped history to the present day and gave us the occupied territories. In just six days, Israel was in control of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. By 1982, Israel had pulled out of the Sinai completely, even dismantling settlements in the process. But as for the rest of the territories, Israel remains earnestly in control, despite what Israeli officials say about Gaza. There already exists uh, two states for the Palestinians, one in uh, Gaza, a full-blown state run by Hamas. Israel's own leading expert on international law, Professor Yoram Dinstein, disagrees. Writing in his International Law of Belligerent Occupation, the proposition that the Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip is over is not the prevalent opinion, and the present writer cannot possibly accept it. Human Rights Watch puts it even more directly. Whether the Israeli army is inside Gaza or redeployed around its periphery, and restricting entrance and exit, it remains in control. And despite what Israel's current information minister Distal Adbarian says, the Israeli Supreme Court has held that the West Bank is indeed held by the state of Israel in belligerent occupation. The long arm of the state in the area is the military commander. It's hard to argue with the fact that the continuing occupation which has been called the world's longest, has brought decreasing material conditions and quality of life for the Palestinians. Whether through home demolitions, routine raids in the West Bank, the blockade of Gaza, which has left nearly half of its citizens unemployed and 80% of its water unfit for human consumption, to discrimination, to checkpoints, to settlements, the consequences of the June 1967 war are a continuing issue. The justification for the war has been, in turn, the justification for the occupation. Israel holds the land today because they faced certain destruction at the hands of the Arabs. So the Israeli story holds. The conventional wisdom has held that it was only because Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser sought to destroy Israel outright that they launched their preemptive attack on the morning of June 5, 1967. According to Israeli historian Avi Schleim in his mammoth history of Israel, The Iron Wall, the Six-Day War was a defensive war. It was launched by Israel to safeguard its security, not to expand its territory. Okay, so in 1967, the Arabs mobilized for all-out war. And this includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, it includes Saudi, it includes Syria. This is going to be the big war where they finally get rid of this nascent Jewish state that is less than 20 years old. In 1967, the Arabs, led this time by Egypt and joined by Syria and Jordan, once again sought to destroy the Jewish state. Gamal Abdel Nasser mobilized troops in the Sinai Peninsula in hopes of eliminating the country. But what if that weren't true? What does that mean for the conflict? That would mean that the continuing military occupation of the occupied territories began and is still predicated on a lie. Let's look at the evidence. But first, a word from our sponsor. Atlas VPN is offering my viewers, for a limited time only, three years of Atlas VPN Premium for only $1.83 per month plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. I get a lot of emails from viewers who are curious to research the topics of my videos further. But if you are concerned with privacy, especially if you live in a country that closely monitors internet activity, it's important you use a proper VPN to hide your IP address. Atlas VPN also blocks ads and malware, and also phishing links. By surfing the internet privately, you can shop and search Google without worrying about tailored results. Another huge advantage is being able to watch content from streaming services that's only available in other countries. This is an amazing deal for three years of Atlas VPN Premium at only $1.83 a month, plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you, Atlas VPN, and thank you for sponsoring this video. The 1967 war needs some context. Just months before the conflict, things had been escalating rapidly between Israel and its neighbors. 
What was once an atmosphere of animosity descended into a road to war on November 16, 1966. On that day, an armored brigade of 4,000 Israeli troops, accompanied by tanks, launched an attack on the village of Samu in the West Bank, which was then under the control of Jordan, a devastating attack which killed 18 Jordanian soldiers. When the first Israeli column reached Samu, the soldiers started a carefully planned destruction of houses and property. Through shelling, airstrikes, and dynamite, the troops destroyed 125 homes, along with other buildings. This marked the most serious escalation of the Arab-Israeli conflict since the 1956 Suez Crisis. Israel claimed that the attack was a reprisal for Palestinian infiltrators crossing into Israel from Jordan. The explanation had little basis in reality, since Jordanian troops had killed more Palestinians crossing into Israel than the Israelis had. Nevertheless, the outcome of the raid was favorable to Israel, since it stoked resentment between the Arab states, especially Egypt and Jordan. Jordan felt that Egypt had failed to come to its defense. The two countries would reconcile, though, reaching a defense pact, which would have important implications in the ensuing Six-Day War. Also in 1966, the Ba'ath Party had come to power in Syria. Their rule would see the adoption of a hardline stance against Israel, and as a result, the Ba'ath regime began sponsoring Palestinian guerrillas to attack its citizens. Though the attacks were, according to former Israeli intelligence chief Yehoshaphat Harkabi, not impressive by any standard. The Israeli establishment would become outwardly hostile in its rhetoric and reportedly considered attacking or even overthrowing the Syrian government. With Army Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin reportedly getting himself in hot water for saying on an Israeli radio show, the moment is coming when we will march on Damascus to overthrow the Syrian government. The situation was close to boiling over, and just two months before the war, six Syrian fighter jets were shot down by Israeli forces. It's possible that this air war, too, was instigated by Israel. Though he wouldn't admit it publicly at the time, Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan would privately tell reporter Rami Tal the truth in 1976. It would be published 21 years later, after Dayan had already died. I know how at least 80% of the clashes there started. In my opinion, more than 80%. It went this way. We would send a tractor to plow someplace in the demilitarized area and knew in advance that the Syrians would start to shoot. If they didn't shoot, we would tell the tractor to advance farther until in the end, the Syrians get annoyed and shoot. And then we would use artillery and later the Air Force. Israel's strategy of escalation on the Syrian front was probably the single most important factor in dragging the Middle East to war in June 1967. Surprisingly, Moshe Dayan appeared to agree. The nature and scale of our reprisal actions against Syria and Jordan had left Nasser with no choice but to defend his image and prestige throughout the Arab world, thereby setting off a train of escalation in the entire Arab region. This escalation culminated in Nasser moving troops into the Sinai and cutting off the Straits of Tehran, which proved to be the nail in the coffin. And on June 5th, war broke out. When the Israelis launched the surprise offensive, they attacked on a Monday, knowing that on Wednesday, the Egyptian vice president would arrive in Washington to talk about reopening the Strait of Tehran. We might not have succeeded in getting Egypt to reopen the Strait, but it was a real possibility. The Six-Day War was the most spectacular military victory in Israel's history. On the morning of Monday, June 5th, Israel launched a surprise first strike against Egypt's air force. Egypt had no fortified bunkers to speak of, leaving its entire fleet exposed. The strike wiped out 90% of its planes, just sitting on the ground. And just like that, virtually the entire Egyptian air force was destroyed in less than two hours. When Jordan and Syria joined the war, their air forces were wiped out that same afternoon. Even an Iraqi airfield near the Jordanian border was obliterated. In all, more than 400 enemy planes were destroyed in a day. In one fell swoop, Israel now enjoyed total air superiority against all its neighbors. The UN Security Council introduced a ceasefire the next day, 
June 6. By Friday, June 9, five days into the war, Israel had defeated the ground forces of Egypt and Jordan, capturing Gaza, the West Bank, and Arab East Jerusalem. Now Jordan, Egypt, and Syria all agreed to cease hostilities, but the Israeli offensive continued. Having already captured the Sinai, the West Bank, and Gaza, Israel continued its offensive on the northern front to capture the Syrian Golan Heights. This move ultimately cost Israel its diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Did Israel invade Syria to safeguard its security? Interestingly enough, in Israeli historian Avi Schleim's same book where he claims the Six-Day War was a defensive war, he cites Moshe Dayan's posthumous interview where he describes the Syrian so-called threat. You don't strike at the enemy because he is a bastard, but because he threatens you. And the Syrians, on the fourth day of the war, were not a threat to us. The war is often talked about for its lightning speed, show of military might, and the territory gained. But one overlooked detail is the massive displacement that followed the Israeli offensive. You see here how the war has destroyed the lives of thousands of families, uprooting them from their homes. Roads throughout the West Bank were crammed with long columns of refugees. Civilians desperately crossed rivers through shattered bridges hoping to seek refuge in Jordan. At a cabinet meeting, Defense Minister Moshe Dayan was overjoyed with the number of refugees. I hope they all go. If we could achieve the departure of 300,000 without pressure, that would be a great blessing. The Nakba, or the major ethnic cleansing campaign of 1948, was less than 20 years earlier. Still fresh and vivid memories of massacres, such as the one at Deir Yassin, compelled many thousands to flee. After the war, they would not be allowed to return. As in 1948, Israeli forces made use of psychological warfare units who blared messages over loudspeakers mounted on jeeps, commanding the Arabs to leave their homes. One operation in the city of Kalkilia forced out as many as 12,000 people and destroyed over 800 homes. The instructions were clear, evacuate the residents and destroy the place. This pattern continued throughout the conflict. Among the largest villages cleansed were Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba. According to Israel's own estimates, the war produced as many as 250,000 refugees. Adding to the more than 700,000 produced as a result of the Nakba, the tally of displacement grew considerably as a result of this short but bloody and devastating conflict. We've discussed the Syrian threat, but the principal threat according to the Israelis, underscored by their first strike, was Egypt. So, did Israel really face imminent destruction from Egypt? In 1967, the dictator of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, announced his plan, in his words, to destroy Israel. In 1971, the now-retired Lyndon Johnson would publish a political memoir of the presidential years. Regarding the Six-Day War, Johnson would speak candidly about Egypt, which was at the time known as the United Arab Republic, or UAR. During the evening of May 26th, I met with Israel's foreign minister, Abba Eban, who said that according to Israeli intelligence, the United Arab Republic was preparing an all-out attack. I asked Secretary McNamara to give Mr. Eban a summary of our findings. Three separate intelligence groups had looked carefully into the matter, McNamara said, and it was our best judgment that a UAR attack was not imminent. Abba Eban's own autobiography, published the next year, indeed included the shocking admission that Nasser did not want war. He wanted victory without war. A similarly worded summary can be found from, amazingly, the chief of Israel's foreign intelligence service, the Mossad. Egypt was not ready for a war, and Nasser did not want a war. Even top military brass went against the official version. In a speech proclaiming Israel's victory on June 12th, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol declared, the Arab leader's hopes of exterminating Israel were dashed. The first challenge to this myth reportedly began with Major General Matityahu Peled in front of an audience at the Zatfa Club in Tel Aviv. The crowd reportedly went into a shock when they heard the now-retired general say, the thesis according to which the danger of genocide hung over us 
and Israel was fighting for her very physical survival, was nothing but a bluff which was born and bred after the war. Peled had an interesting reason for speaking so bluntly. He was actually offended by people saying that. To pretend that the Egyptian forces were capable of threatening Israel's existence not only insults the intelligence of any person capable of analyzing this kind of situation, but is primarily an insult to the Zahal, meaning the Israeli army. Several other generals then followed suit. There never was a danger of extermination, said Ezra Weissman, who commanded the Israeli Air Force during its devastating first strike against Egypt. We were not threatened with genocide on the eve of the Six-Day War, and we never thought of such a possibility, observed General and Deputy Chief of Staff Haim Barlev. And we can't forget the Chief of Staff, who was none other than future Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who told Le Monde in May 1972, I do not believe that Nasser wanted war. And finally, from the mouth of another Prime Minister, during his tenure in 1982, Menachem Begin stated flatly, the Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches did not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. More than half a century of military occupation. While time seemed to have a somewhat civilizing effect on the Jim Crow South or apartheid South Africa, the Palestinians have not shaken their subjugation. In fact, it has only become gravely worse with time. It came as a shock to the Western world when the Second Intifada broke out, on the heels of the Second Oslo Accords, which was seen as such a triumphant success for Jews and Arabs alike. But whereas the Palestinians once upon a time were able to, say, drive from Ramallah to Jerusalem in under a half hour, or travel from Gaza to the West Bank, new checkpoints, walls, and Israeli permits almost impossible to attain blocked their free movement. Arabs now use different buses, roads, even using different license plates, causing the progressive constriction of Palestinian life. Indeed, things only got worse after Oslo. More than half a million settlers now reside in the West Bank, with no sign of slowing down, bulldozing houses to pave way for new ones. And with the new Israeli regime more hardline than ever, the prospect of full annexation of the West Bank seems more and more likely. By taking the civil administration of the West Bank out of the hands of the military and into civilian control, it will be administered by the federal government of Israel. With the help of its major patron, the United States. In 2019, the Trump administration officially recognized the Syrian Golan Heights as being under the full sovereignty of Israel. When asked by the press if this sets a dangerous precedent, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo cited none other than the June 1967 war. Israel was fighting a defensive battle to save its nation. I need your help. This channel relies on donations and patrons. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to support me and what I do, please consider becoming a patron. There are exclusive videos there. I accept donations through PayPal, Cash App. I also accept cryptocurrency. I accept Bitcoin and Ethereum donations. So please, if you want to support me, become a patron, give a donation. Uh, those are ways that you can support me. And of, of course, most of all, most importantly of all, please subscribe to the channel um, if you want to see more videos like this. Thank you so much. Take care. I love you so much.